Welcome everybody. Well, first of all, my apologies for the title, for such an informal title. <laughs> but I was inspired by this template, you know. I saw, I imagine these two twin brothers saying one to each other. Uh, I thought, what can they say one to each other related to my topic? Then I came up with this, look bro, no hands, you know, about the unmanned technology. But then I thought, okay, calm down, think about another title that it's too informal. So I came up with this one, with the second title, The Experiences of us, the Geomatics Division, with unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, so now it's a long way that we've come with these technologies, with UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, in our division, the former Institute of Geomatics. So we thought it might be a good time to stop, compile them, and try to explain them as far as we can. So um, along these days, uh, along this time that we've been working with this technology, we developed, we shaped quite a particular view on what is a drone or a UAV for us. And then uh, let me try to uh, explain you with a video uh, what is, under the perspective of geomatics, what we understand as a drone or as a UAV. SenseFly is an EPFL spin-off that develops and markets small drones like this one that weigh typically less than one kilogram, so these are inherently safe. And basically they can fly completely autonomously. They have an autopilot and they are equipped with a small camera that can take pictures such that after the flight we can reconstruct maps uh, using a software that is developed by uh, PIX4D, another EPFL uh, spin-off. We're speaking about an accuracy of 10 centimeters, so you can really do many things like uh, measuring volumes in mining, for example, or in uh, quarries and stuff like that. So very recently at uh, SenseFly, we went and mapped the Matterhorn. For this mission, we went to Zermatt with three drones that flew in total for six hours, and they took almost 3,000 images. We wanted to demonstrate that our product are capable of, uh, first of all, coping with the challenge of mapping a 3D object, be able to uh, fly at very high altitude. We are talking here about 5,000 meters, and finally also cope with the turbulences that are uh, typically found around mountainous environments. And now we are really blushed away by this awesome 3D model that we generated from these pictures. So this is what we understand by a drone. This is a typical application of geomatics with UAVs, right? So this is half below half a kilo, and it's mapping fully one of the highest uh, peaks in Switzerland. So that's quite impressive potential. Now, uh, but how everything started? So how do we get to that point? I mean, uh, what is the story behind these platforms and, and, and sensors that are able to do this? And uh, also, uh, besides the story, uh, what are the main components of these systems and what is the size or the, what are we talking about in terms of size of markets, of science behind it? So this is the agenda I propose for today that trying to answer some of these questions. At the end, the third part, we'll be reviewing uh, precisely our experiences, projects and initiatives uh, related to this technology. So, first of all, welcome to history class. This is uh, the first part of, of the talk. Uh, and as the tale says, once upon a time, aerial images were taken. Because if you review stories of UAVs precisely for geomatics, you have to, uh, or is kind of related with the history of aerial imaging. And the first milestone of aerial imaging that you find in history, it's in 1858 by Tournachon, that was a French photographer or artist that he also liked balloons. So he kind of made the fusion of the two ideas. He bring a, a camera with his balloon and make the first pictures, aerial images uh, in history. Unfortunately, there is no materials from this, uh, from Tournachon nowadays, but, uh, so that's kind of a shame, right? But it's recognized, it's well documented. Now, two years later, 1860, James Black, he was American, he, with the same technology, so a camera and a balloon, uh, he took uh, pictures from Boston. What you're looking now is the first aerial image ever. I mean, the one that we still have uh, nowadays. From Boston, he titled Boston as the Eagle and Wild Goose Sea, right? So it's 600 meters, that's not, uh, that's not bad at all. So as you can see, the history of early imaging starts 
with something closer to what UAVs might be rather than with airplanes, which is the conventional way of taking images. We move uh, further on in 1882, Douglas Archibald. He was a British meteorologist. He, was used, he used to, put, uh, to use guides and put some sensors on it, uh, temperature, humidity sensors. And one day he thought, well, I might put also a camera. He triggered it with some explosions and, and stuff. And he made also experiments with, uh, with uh, imaging. Right? I would say this is the first remotely piloted platform ever, because he was actually piloting it. It was a kite. Uh, there is no materials also from this guy nowadays. But some years later, Alfred Nobel, besides uh, funding the famous prizes, uh, the scientific prizes, he also uh, was a fan of rockets and photography. So he again put the two ideas together. He put a rocket, a camera on it, on it and here you can see an actual picture of uh, his experiments in 1897. Uh, I would say this is actually the first unmanned uh, experiment ever, because it was a rocket and it was no guidance at all in these rockets. But my favorite one comes here, and this is not even unmanned or remotely piloted. This is a pigeon. This was an experiment by Julius Neubrunner. Uh, he was a German apothecary, so his goal was to deliver medicines across all the small towns there. And then he was uh, used to work with pigeons, and he also liked photography, so again, he just fused the two ideas, and uh, generate this, this funny experiment, right? Although he gathered pictures like this one, this is not bad at all, so it's pretty high, you can see here a very nice building, you can actually see the wings here from the pigeon. Uh, it was, he became very famous, he patented this idea some years later, uh, but he, he got, the idea got faded away by the blush of uh, airplanes or conventional airplanes because we are now at the doors of the First World War, so uh, everything started with conventional uh, airplanes. This is what we understand now by aerial, modern aerial photography, right? And it takes from, let's say, beginning of 20th century up to today. Uh, now, to fully understand where UAVs are born, we have to go to the military side. Now, World War uh, One uh, started working with Zeppelins and aerial torpedoes. Actually, the first documented UAV is the Kettering Buck from the USA. That's 1980, uh, 1918. And uh, later on, on World War II, there were a lot of advances in radio control. So that would enable uh, this technology. And actually, there was a development by the British Royal Navy called Queen Bee. And I read somewhere the story about a general saying he saw the platform flying, uh, hearing at the platform and saying, a bee, it sounds, to me, it sounds more like a drone. You know, like a, the drones are the male honeybees. So it says this is the first time that we hear the word drone to uh, apply to a UAV. Uh, the main focuses was, were actually not for imaging. They were used as missiles or decoys, like to fool uh, defenses uh, from the enemies. And it was beyond 1960 that they're uh, starting to use as spies, so with cameras to take images and come back. Uh, there is a milestone here from uh, the Israel force. Uh, there is a victory in Syria, 1982, that the, uh, it is said it's considered to be the point where all the armies in the world uh, adopt uh, UAV technology as part, regular part of their army. So this is quite a milestone. Besides, this was the, the raising of uh, UAVs among the militaries, but we prefer to explore the peaceful use of technologies related to geomatics. Now, if we come to the first use, what we consider the first use of a UAV for geomatics, we get to this experiment. Uh, this is by Vesta Edinhaus and Pritz Villa, two professors from Bochum University in Germany. They took this actual platform, so it's a fixed wing, like a small airplane, well, small three meter long, three meter wingspan, and uh, it had one camera, you can actually see the lens down there, and it was assisted, so it was, it was with manual guidance actually. They took images and they make the image orientation a posteriori. They had problems with this experiment because the images were actually very blurry, and they had problems to land and take off because of runway sizes. So they decided to move to this other prototype that was a helicopter, radio control, pretty regular, I would say. Three kilo payload, it flew up to 100 meters, 
it was manual guided and the, the shutter, the camera shutter was manual by radio link. So that was more convenient. Now, uh, this was uh, done for an application to document a kind of a structure of a monorail. And this is, I, I found this actual image uh, from the experiment. Uh, this is pretty much uh, of this experiment. So is, this, we would say, is the first conventional geomatic or photogrammetric exercise with UAVs, 1979, 1980. This was important not for the results, but more for the proof of concept. And this is, uh, this is true because some years later, we find the first industrial aerial robot. That's 1987. That's the year of production, although it was requested by the Japanese government in 1983, and it was a prototype by Yamaha, the famous Japanese company. This is called the Air Max R50. It's very famous among the UAVs. It's 100 kilos. It's 3.63 meters long, uh, one meter height, uh, 28 kilos of capacity, and was actually developed for agricultural uh, applications. That was the main or, or the initial uh, application. But it also was used uh, for Earth observation. They did uh, imaging of the volcano Usu in Hokkaido Island in Japan. And this was a very important milestone also because it was considered the first automatic GPS-driven flight by a UAV. So this, is, this, is now, this is, was the first time and all UAVs now are driven mostly by GPS. So it was important. Year 2000. Unfortunately, there was an, an, a crisis, an export crisis with China in 2003. There were some platforms sold by Yamaha to the Chinese government. They didn't announce this to the Japanese government. So some years later, Japanese government figured out and told Yamaha, what have you done? Uh, you have to close the production of this line. I think they're doing some prototypes now, but it's not, it's like, it, it hasn't, uh, it's not the same technology as, uh, as it was. Anyway, so that was important because it was the first industrial materialization of the concept. And now we're moving to year 2000, where we start the era of the commercial of the shelf. So you can go to a shop and buy components, and you can do it yourself. So this is the combination of these two things are producing a new era. And this is where, in my opinion, it appears the new uh, the new multi-copter concept, which is rather, I would say, the most uh, regular platforms now. Uh, I was trying to find the internet what was the first prototype. It was very hard, but I would say uh, this is the, the oldest reference I got, the Dragonflyer 3, year 2000. That's quite a long time ago. I know it is not, but in terms of UAVs, it is. And I, I would also uh, uh, mention this company, German company, Microcopters. They started in 2005 because they really sold a lot of uh, platforms, and a lot of them are used for aerial imaging as well. Also, uh, there's uh, a, an important component of UAVs are autopilots. Of course, you, you don't guide all UAVs all the time manually. You have to let them fly autonomously. And the appearance of uh, autopilots was, was crucial. 2003, they, they started this Paparazzi project. It was a very, it was an open source hardware and software uh, initiative to develop autopiloting. And this was like the mother of all the other actual autopilots you can find nowadays. For example, the Arducopter or Ardupilot, which is a, a famous uh, autopilot of, of several platforms today, uh, were based in Paparazzi's uh, development. So. I mentioned for them here. Up to nowadays, this is what you see if you Google image, uh, the word drone. This is not random, I would say. Of course, it's Google. It's not random. <laughs> but uh, you can see here very famous recent platforms. As for example, you might recognize these ones. This is the Predator uh, drone by the American Army. Uh, this is the typical image you see in the Afghanistan, Afghanistanese uh, mountains, right? This is a war drone, of course. But you can also see this one here, or this one here. This is the Amazon Prime Air. So this initiative by, by Amazon saying that they would, uh, they would uh, load and uh, make cargo transportation, right? And this is also a kind of famous drone used by the British police with cameras. So what you see here is actually a, a good representation of the most famous uh, UAVs you see now on the news or on, on literature, right? So um, this was a history. Hopefully, you get a, an overview of how everything started and how we got to to nowadays. Now, uh, let's talk about what are the 
main components of these systems and what are the, some facts and numbers about uh, UAVs now. So UAVs are actually called UAS, Unmanned Aerial Systems, because you have, we have to understand them as a system of systems. It's a bunch of a lot of technologies put together and forming a new concept. Uh, I would say the holy trinity of this concept, so there are three main things uh, of UAS, are these ones. So if you could divide air and ground, on one side you have the aerial platform, of course. On the other side you have the control station, and in between them you have the data link. So this is like the basic architecture of UAVs, UASs, actually. Now, from the side of the aerial platform, we have many examples that we've seen before, but I would say these three types of uh, platforms are the most predominant. So fixed wing, rotor wing with a single helix, and multi-copter. So several, uh, several helix, right? Now, from control stations, you can actually find a lot of them. So one, on one side, you have the vehicle to transport in, uh, from trucks to vans to cars and, uh, and accessories. And on the other side, you have the actual controlling computers uh, of this. So you can find them like a lot of very complex with simulation environments and so, two very portable on the field uh, stations, right? Uh, on the, on the side of the data, data link, we found a lot of technologies for communicating, for communicating the aerial platform and the control station. Um, and, well, so this is, these are some examples representing this holy trinity. But besides the holy trinity, there's, I would say, two other pieces that are fundamental, that are, that are enabling the applications of UAVs. First one is a payload. And here you have a broad range of sensors that have actually been mounted on platforms from optical cameras, com uh, commercial of the shelf, so the ones that you can buy for yourself. Uh, here you see a LiDAR, you can also see mini radars, and also other communication uh, payloads to make you know, relays. Uh, so this is also an important part of the systems, but the other component that it's always there, uh, it's regulations, and this layer is affecting everything. Actually, regulations is said that is uh, the most restrictive layer in these systems, or at least it has been up to now. Uh, so this is the picture of what a UAS may look like. But now, another holy trinity is what we understand to be the top three of actual platforms that you can buy uh, in relation to geomatics, of course. So the first one is what you, you saw in the initial video, that's the Swinglet Cam by a Swiss company called uh, SenseFly. That's less than half a kilo. It has an actual uh, maximum payload of uh, 125 grams. Endurance means time of flight. Uh, it's 30 minutes for these platforms. It has GPS on board, attitude sensors, radio and autopilot. And the price, as I checked, uh, and, and this is a 2013 price, it's around $10,000 uh, for this platform. This is very well sold. I mean, it's a, it's a good platform and a lot of groups use it. Second platform I would, I would highlight is this UX5 by company Trimble, United States. That's 2.5 kilos, so it's a little bit bigger. Uh, fixed payload, uh, they are using Sony commercial cameras. Not, uh, you can find them uh, on, on shops. Endurance is a little bit more, 15 minutes. Again, sensors are pretty much the same, GPS, IMU, uh, barometer and compass, and the price is a little bit uh, more, so that's uh, $51,000. Uh, that's the, the, the second. And the third, this is a platform that we especially like somehow. This is the Falcon 8 by a German company called Ascending Technologies, 2.2 uh, 2 .2 kilos. They accept, or they have been a lot of variations of the payload, so in terms of sensors integrated on here, here you see optical cameras, also thermal cameras. Uh, it has also, it features 360 degrees capability of turning the camera, this is very interesting, it might be interesting. It has less endurance, so less than 22 minutes. Uh, besides the bunch of sensors here, I put here plus plus because these guys do a lot of uh, research in algorithms for navigation. So there's a lot of interesting features in their autopilot there for navigating. And the price is not bad, so it's 18,000 18, euros for you to know. This is the top three of platforms, I would say, for uh, geomantics, right? Uh, some facts and numbers. So UAS are, are a big market now, a big portion. 
uh, there are 17,000 UAS done by uh, 540 producers around th uh, 53 countries. So this is data from uh, UAS International, big uh, research or organization dealing with the study of this, uh, of this ecosystem. Then the global market, of course, you know, the numbers are big. So this is also from a study from markets and markets. And it's expected to grow even more. And besides the production uh, portion, we also try to uh, track the, the research part. So we, uh, uh, we track the papers from this International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, which is a society related to us, to geomatics. And we tracked, we did this exercise of tracking the number of papers uh, since 2004 up to now. And as you see, the big congress that they had in 2004, you see three papers from UABs. That 2004, it was, there were multi-captures already there, but the not really established. Now, 2008, you see 21 papers and nine sessions devoted to UABs up to now, which is more than 50 papers. Uh, in nine sessions. I think this is wrong. It's not nine sessions. I think it's more. Now, uh, what happens with geomatics and UAVs especially, it's something that is really cool. That uh, I think it's very syn synergic because, uh, as I put here, geomatics, we know the applications. What we didn't really know, the uh, platforms. And the, all the people from robotics on the other side, they know the platforms, but they really didn't uh, target the application. So I think that has been important to uh, that these two worlds came together because they have generated a lot of research in that sense. Actually, since 2015, uh, 2011, there is a congress devoted to UVs and geomatics. That's two editions now. The next edition will be in, in Canada, I think 2015. So that means that it's really a, a established technology for geomatics. Applications, there is a myriad of applications. I mean, there is a lot. You can read all about it. I would start by the conventional one. So Earth observation, by this I, I try to globe all the geomatic related ones. So uh, cartographic production, uh, terrain modeling, et cetera, et cetera. Everything you can do with a sensor in order to observe uh, the Earth or the surface, right? But then there's also live observation, just following or analyzing plants, vegetation in general, analyzing animals, tr animal tracking, or humans, for example. Uh, infrastructure inspection, I would say it's very conventional application now. So uh, doing inventory or seeing if there is any damage on the infrastructures. Also surveillance, I mean border patrol, border control for surveillance. But now here there are three applications that I would say they are not conventional and they are boosting now. F uh, first one is mine detection. So there's some developments now with UAVs trying to detect mines that are hidden. Uh, so try to detect them uh, with aerial vehicles, right? So remotely detecting. Communication broadcast, as you might know, because they are big actors now like Facebook and Google at least, uh, buying uh, companies of drones just to make relief communications and try to, to provide extended coverage. So this is uh, pretty important now. And also cargo transportation. I mentioned the Amazon example uh, previously, but Google is also inside this business. So this we might see it uh, in the upcoming years. So applications, there are a lot of them. Now, regulations is a complex issue in UFEs, very complex. I would say they are ad hoc, so made specially for every case. Uh, and it depends really on, on every country. Actually, 150 kilos, it's a barrier, and under this, Regulation said that are national, they are per country. So every country has to regulate uh, below this uh, price. There's also been a lot of years of discussion on what is the most suitable name for this. UAV, RPIS, which is remotely piloted aircraft system. Uh, this was actually put by, uh, by the Civil Aviation Authority, the international one. Uh, well, there's a lot of names. I would say the most uh, conventional are UAVs or drones because they are, it's, it's the most famous name, right? Now, there's already companies getting special permits for special works. We know some of them for geomatics. Uh, and in Spain, in the special case of Spain, serious regulation uh, is now up there, uh, out there since this July. But there's been episodes of uh, even ban, UAB ban, uh, and then after, and after this ban, we had this, this regulation. I'm not extending on this topic because as I said, it's very complex and you can read about it if you're, if you're interested on this. 
So uh, this is uh, a review of the size of this, uh, of this technology in terms of markets and architectures. And now let me present some initiatives that we did. We had with the former Institute of Geomatics and now with the, the Geomatics Division. And the first experience that we have was a project called Microvision. So MooVision, Microvision. It was helicopter UAV based earth observation. So the goal was to investigate you know, light, lightweight platforms. We're talking about year 2006. Lightweight was the <laughs> size of helicopters. Try to think that mine was put on manned airplanes for uh, photography from aerial imaging. So this was considered a lightweight uh, platform. And uh, we had the chance to, well, this was a Spanish-Brazilian uh, cooperation initiative, and it enabled uh, working with this platform from one group in Navarra called Asociación de la Industria Navarra that uh, were uh, doing these robots and they allow us to put our payloads on that. So it was very convenient for us to make research with these platforms. And uh, yeah, well, you see here the, the consortium here. And what I would say, this is a close up picture of the system flying. What I would say is was, this is was very pioneering in terms of UAV photogrammetry. This started with an INS course because in 2003, we, the Institute of Geomatics was doing a course in inertial navigation. And these guys from Navarra precisely came because they were willing to develop their own autopilot for some type of unmanned platforms. 2003, that was kind of new for us. So since that point, we worked together and the, the consecution was this project. Here you see, uh, this is called the Siemens uh, star, I think. Uh, it's a photogrammetric target to test the resolution of camera. So this is a normal picture of the, of the target. And here you see an actual picture from the platform. So we did these exercises in this project. It was very interesting and very fruitful for us. Second experience that we had, uh, it was the project Ituma uh, that was the, led by Aurensis company, now it's Telespazio, I think. And uh, we got to know here more about this technology. Precisely, uh, it was, um, it targeted the use of thermal imaging from UAVs. Now, we, we, our part was to investigate algorithms for orientation of these images. Problem is that this project uh, really got problems for flying. That was also 2008. It was not, it was difficult still to fly platforms freely. So they got problems to fly it. And, uh, and at the end, there was one flight, but we couldn't do much more with this data. So we, it was, for us, it was good to investigate all the techniques and technologies suitable for these uh, platforms also. Thermal imaging is very conventional, I would say, now for UAVs as well. Another initiative that was not a project, it was a full collaboration with a Brazilian company, Orbisat. It was the Sarvant uh, platform. This, uh, it, that was, uh, the goal was to mount a synthetic aperture radar in an unmanned aerial vehicle. So through all this project, it was like five years of collaboration. We participated in a lot of aspects, not just but, well, uh, we, we participated in the development of the navigation system, in the acquisition system from the sensors on board, and we also got to know the application with the radar. So uh, that's been very fruitful also because uh, we've worked in many aspects, as I just said. And the idea, let me just give you a glance of the idea because I think it's very cool. So we've heard uh, some, uh, some, some about the synthetic aperture radar technology by Michele on, on, from the other department in geomatics. And this was the purpose was to miniaturize this technology and put it in a UAV. Now, what you can do with this platform? So this is the concept. Uh, here you see a plane scanning with a radar on the X band, right? So you could be able to map uh, the, the upper part of this foliage of this tree coverage. But the plane, the SAR band, so the miniaturized plane, targeted also a, a radar with the P band. So this P band would actually be able to map under this tree foliage. So once you have these two measures, one of the applications was, for example, to make a difference so you can measure the biomass of the trees. This is very important in the Amazonia, for example, to really measure the volumes of these trees. Also, of course, you have the ability to see under the trees. There's a lot of portion in the Amazonia that is actually unseen, so nobody really knows how the terrain looks like. So having the P-band functionality here is very interesting. So this was the goal of this project, and uh, it's been a five-year collaboration. Uh, with this uh, Brazilian company, Orbisat. This is very interesting. 
Now we got to this point, 2008 was inception, but it started 2010, that we made the Close Search project. That uh, was our first experience with the leadership of an FP7 project. Uh, that was again also a very fruitful project for us because we again worked with the same uh, company I mentioned before from Navarra. We uh, again uh, were able to put our payloads in this platform and explore not just from the navigation part, uh, so we put our navigation systems on board uh, to make online real-time navigation, but we also explored the remote sensing, so the, the cameras part of that. We worked with optical cameras and thermal cameras. And the application was very nice also because it was a search and rescue of lost people in the mountains. So the idea is somebody gets lost, you send one of these, it flies around, you're able to see it and report back its position. So the application was very good, very nice. And uh, we did this project, it was a two-year project from the FP7 Galileo uh, part. And uh, I here have a video that explains the idea again and shows a little bit the, the scope of the thing. It, this is from the local news from TV3 and it was the news about the, some tests that we did for the project. Aquest helicòpter és un prototip especialitzat en la recerca de persones perdudes. Els aparells que porta li permeten volar de manera automàtica, controlat per GPS i pentinar sistemàticament el territori. Protecció Civil, que participa en aquest programa aportant el punt de vista de l'usuari final, creu que pot ser una eina molt útil. Si pots acotar una zona on creus que hi pot haver la persona, pots programar que faci una batuda en una àrea determinada, no? fent una ziga-zaga o fent... rodant en cercle, en un cercle concèntric cap a l'interior. L'helicòpter és fruit d'un projecte de recerca liderat per l'Institut de Geomàtica de la Universitat Politècnica de Catalunya. De la construcció de l'aparell se n'ha encarregat una empresa navarresa i pot volar de dia i també de nit, quan els helicòpters convencionals no poden. Va equipat amb una càmera d'infrarrojos que detecta els cossos per la temperatura que desprenen. Pot ser un excursionista perdut, pot ser un voletaire perdut. Un cop eh, es tingui la certesa o probabilitat alta de que eh, allò que hem vist en la imatge pot ser una persona que estem buscant, doncs eh, hi poden anar els eh, equips de rescat. L'Agència Europea de Navegació per Satèl·lit ha finançat aquest programa amb 300.000 dels 500.000 euros que ha costat. Aquesta agència es dedica a promoure aplicacions pel sistema europeu EGNOS, que millora el sistema GPS i pel futur sistema Galileo. En total ja se han invertit 80 milions d'euros per a subvencionar uns 70 projectes en tota Europa i aquest és un d'aquests projectes. El projecte gairebé està acabat i el repte a partir d'ara serà aconseguir fabricar-ne una versió comercial. Els clients potencials seran els serveis de protecció civil de tot el món per utilitzar-lo en missions de busca i rescat de persones. And uh, so that was a big thing for us. We explored, as we said, not just the application was fine, but we explored a lot of very interesting uh, topics related to navigation. As uh, you've heard, the use of EGNOS, this European system for navigation. So we, I would say it was the first experiments with EGNOS in UAVs for navigation. So this we were able to, to do. This is an actual project and that is keeping me busy all the time. That is called Perigeo, and it's about testing space technologies in various fields, navigation, imaging, ta ta ta, uh, with the use or through the use of unmanned aerial vehicles. So you know there's, there's in space missions there's a big gap between intensive simulations, computer simulation, up to the final mission which is one shot, very expensive. Now in between there is this layer where you can test uh, these technologies and raise the TRL levels, the technology readiness levels. And uh, so we thought it might be a good idea to do so with UAVs. And here we are. We're actually doing, uh, we're focusing on space navigation, so navigation using images and processing these images to extract relevant features. And we, we will be testing everything, when I say everything is everything, uh, through three uh, tests now at the end of this year, so uh, October, November, and December. Uh, yeah, 
that's a big project. We're talking about seven companies, six OPs, and uh, it's ending by March 2015, or yeah, that's actually uh, 2015. So that's a current project. What else? GeneSec, that's an also a current project. Um, on the use, or we are here we're doing more consultancy, technology consultancy and algorithms consultancy to a company called Eclexis because they want to develop a, a small, low weight, uh, low cost uh, autopilot for small drones, right? Uh, and they, they are willing to do this based on our consultancy, so based on our algorithms and, and advices, not just on the algorithms part, but also on the technology part. We did a, an extensive market search uh, of auto, autopilots and technologies uh, for this project. So we are, we are at this, it started 2013, so we are right in the middle of the project. Uh, and this is uh, our tasks now. And more to come. Why I say this? Because if we look at the trends of geomatics, I would say the trends in geomatics actually point or converge to UAVs. On the size of sensor and system technology, if you look at these two pictures, this is a, what we call a large format camera, DMC camera, big one, the one that was on the main, uh, main airborne uh, airplanes, right? Taking uh, big photographs of the, of the Earth. This is a Nokia camera, 41 megapixel, mounted on a smartphone, right? Actually, these two cameras, when flown, one with main airplane and the other one with UAVs, are having the same ground sampling distance. That means you actually see the same portion of terrain per picture. That's amazing. That's like saying with the same technology, different platforms, sorry, with very different technology and different platforms, you can actually do the same. This is a lot of potential. And this is the trend. So the trend is miniaturization. And this, there's also exercises with UAVs mounting this smartphone and using it as a camera for Earth observation. Also, you can see here our family, our TAC family. This is a development from lots of years in geomatics. Uh, these are sensor acquisition systems, so navigation systems interface with those systems to gather uh, their data and also to make some processing. Uh, so this is uh, the, our first prototype, 60, 60, 60, and th more than 30 kilos. We got to this one. This was actually flying in close search. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, it was mounted on the belly of the helicopter, three kilos, and now we are working with this. Here you see one cent coin. So this is uh, 300 uh, grams. So uh, all this family, we are working towards also miniaturization, also not just in sensors, but in systems, in acquisition systems. And this fits, again, converges to the line of UAVs. So that's one more example. And again, back to the sensor side. This is, let me present you our family of uh, inertial measurement <laughs> units. This we have it there in geomatics building, by the way. Whenever you want to come, we can, we can explain those to you. And these are all inertial measurement units. So from the big one, blue box here, up to the lower one. Here you see an euro coin. All this is inertial technology, I would say rather regular technology for navigation of all types of platforms. And as you see, the trend here is very clear as well. So it, so the convergence is also appearing here. And not just from the sensors and systems, but also for the applications. One example of application that we, are, that we think it fits or it suits for UAVs is airborne gravimetry. We did one project, FP7. The project was called GAL. It was about measuring variations of the gravitational field with inertial technology precisely. Okay, so for GAL, we use this big blue one here. Now, our idea is to extend this concept and bring it to UAVs with lower cost technology, smaller technology, but uh, placed in a, in a, in a UAV uh, platform. So this is part of the proposals that we are, we are getting these days. So I think this might be all. Just a final slide to, rem to uh, place here some four references that for us are very important here. The first one is a reference in, from 2007, from this microvision project that was very, it was our entrance to this world, so we, we have a lot of respect for this project. And we presented here in Barcelona in the, in the International Geomatic Week. There was another uh, paper presented in, in China in this ISPRS Congress 2008, 
Uh, remember 2008 there were not that many papers from UAV so we got one and it's quite referenced and then there's uh, one paper in the Inside Genesis magazine which is a navigation magazine that we like a lot and we follow it and so we got the cover uh, history uh, related to the closed search project so it was called Drones to the Rescue and finally there is a very recent paper from June this year that it's uh, in the journal of the ISPRS and uh, we Try, we have tried to compile all that we know from platforms and review all that is existing up to now and put it in this paper. Actually, most of, this, of the slides or the work in this presentation are ripping from this uh, paper. So that's it, finally. So thank you, and if there's any questions, I'll be glad to take it. sure that exists of course there's actually a category one among the big categories of UAVs there is one called UCAV so unmanned combat aerial vehicles because there is special designs like blind to radars uh, a lot of features like to not be detected and so and so so they, they exist and they are a category itself but also in the military there's I think they are doing multi-purpose uh, platforms so they're carrying this Predator one, it's very big, I think it's like 20 meters wingspan. So they're carrying, besides uh, weapons, they're carrying all types of sensors, cameras, radars, all type of communication uh, devices, because they are guided or connected through satellite communication, like end-to-end uh, -end from the, in the world, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, I believe there's, there's a lot of this. I'm not really onto no, onto no, this, no, but uh, if, if you knew, actually, yeah, if uh, I I couldn't I couldn't mention yeah. any. I'm sure there is uh, collaborations like tight. I mean, in the USA, this is very actual, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, I'm not really into into this. Yeah. I prefer the geometric side of the yeah, <laughs> of the platform. Yeah, this is the one, yeah, I know, no. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, this is better. But there is a lot to read there out there in the news also. No, so. I'm just saying that because I think that okay. Indeed, there is. If you, you would see the portions, I would say the big portion is in the army, but also because it's more expensive. Exactly. And then uh, we, should, we shall see also the other portions of sectors of applications that are being funded. But, yeah. Okay. Okay.
I said, uh, for us it brought a lot of knowledge from, I would say, uh, from, the, from the several subsystems that we placed on there. So in terms of navigation, for example, what we did in closed search is actively continuing. And we are waiting a chance also to explore, to continue exploring the use of EGNOS, for example, with UAVs. This is very interesting. Now, from the application side, Well, the, so the plan in Close Search was that AIN, the company having the platform, would, uh, would continue developments to reach a closed market uh, prototype, working closely with the actors that were involved in there. We worked with uh, Protección Civil here in Catalonia, right? But as far as I know, uh, AIN couldn't, well, now the group, the robotics group in AIN, it uh, has gone down, and uh, there, there is actually one person continuing their, their development. They're not even working with the big platforms, which is actually very inconvenient, and they're moving to the, to the small drones. So I might say that, uh, that there is none uh, going on from their side. So what we did then, in view of this, is to try to, f to, to find other funding opportunities for the same idea. Uh, this is from our side, but as far as I know, they are. They, it's it has been very complicated since close search on from them to continue with these platforms, because they're very big, they're very complex, and things happen, you know. And they had a couple of accidents, for example, and they got funding cuts and blah blah blah, crises, blah blah blah. I don't know if I answered your question. Or not. <coughs> Requirements or restrictions? I mean. Requirements in the sense that I can, uh, I must transmit, for example, in search and rescue, when mm -hmm. you look for a body, um, I guess you need more or less real time information, right, in the, in the mm -hmm. command and control code. So, uh, and it's not the same probably that when you uh, remotely trigger the taking a picture that you can. Is there a single set of requirements for all That's right. applications? Or As I said, regulations in general are, um, ha haven't been that developed up to now. But regulations are affecting the whole system, right? So, and then one, of, one part of regulations is safety, of course. So uh, I think the requirements, that that's one set of requirements for, for the systems covering all the applications is that you have to fly safe. Now, in order to fly safe, and particularly applying to this data link, you need, of course, real-time transmission. You need secure uh, data channels. Excuse me for, for the specific words there. I might not be using the ones. But uh, in, in few words, you need to ensure that your data link for C2, so command and control, has to be safe, has to be continuous, uninterrupted, that big enough to carry all the information and that's it. And that's, uh, that's one set of restrictions, requirements, applying to all applications. So it, it is not that it's search and rescue, it is cartography, da, da, da. I don't think there are requirements towards or with respect to the application. Okay. But there are for the systems to be safe. OK. But this is in terms of regulation. I was more interested huh. in the technical side of the story. So uh, when you think about an application, if you are doing search and rescue, uh -huh. I mean, 
yes, that that was the case. I mean, with with closer there was a we created that board of users of search and rescue users that we met, I think, twice or three times during the project precisely to do this, to push them to give us requirements. Because, of course, like from scratch, they would not even know what to say, but that's normal. I mean, they, they do not know the technology, they really don't know. But when you push them, they got, you got things like this, like, okay, if I want to operate this, I need one image every, and then you take this, and you drop it and, and you break it into your requirements. In, but, but in closed search, we had to do this specific effort to get those. I would say users, unless they are very, um, they, they, they know very much the technology, you would not get this. I think, but I think that's a standard with uh, you know, okay, so technological. You that you take these requirements for this specific application and, and then you select the appropriate for example, this was, the, this was the precise exercise that we did in Close Search. We investigate, for example, uh, Iridium satellites for communication, uh, because also AIN had experience with this, and we dropped that option, because actual testing showed that it was not reliable at all, and it, there was delays. So then we explored precisely the YMAX option. That was very good, because there is also, but this you know better than me, there was a plan in Catalonia, at least, to uh, had, uh, to have uh, intensive coverage of WiMAX, also in rural areas. So we might that fit. Uh, we, we thought that might fit with the concept of going everywhere, right? And having links of uh, WiMAX, and WiMAX uh, has uh, has the bandwidth uh, ideal for this. So that's that was that's a specific study we did in close search. What there, there's now efforts in research uh, working on, on swarms of UAVs, work cooperative swarms. There is a group in uh, Sevilla called CATEC, uh, which they are very good uh, internationally uh, with, with drones, and they work with swarms, cooperative. And so you can see these nice videos like in a scenario all flying together and try to, you know, establishing communication and even try to avoiding them uh, among. Uh, among each other. So this exists and there is research. We haven't done anything with swarms, but it's very interesting. Also, this CATEC group does something that is very spectacular, that they work with robotic arms, so, the, so dro uh, drones cooperate to grab things with the arms and lift it. It's amazing. And, this, and they have to communicate to this. You need somebody to monitor them, oh. but they are fully autonomous. Ah, okay. There is always there is there, there needs to be a person actually on the ground. But there the has to be. The, uh, the regulations. Mm, again, regulations are like. Yeah. Well, I think. Well, yeah, I think regulations state that there must be, there must be someone, or and there must be a link, and there must be a, a fail-safe mechanism. Like you, you have to take control, but. Uh, beyond regulations, I think nobody having UAVs would <laughs> would be crazy enough to fly it and like don't look at it or don't even control. They would yeah, not do that. It can fall, you may have some <laughs> that's right. That's right. But the but the the minimum the minimum requirement is uh, all groups works like this. Is like you have to be able to take control of the drone all the time in any time in any time, just in case anything happens. So, and here, for example, there's an interesting concept called beyond line of sight operation. Like, can we do this without actually seeing the platform? This technologically, it's solved, but regulations are like, no.
Thank you.